Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today, we're going to talk about the top five supplements to help improve sleep. Before I get into that, we made other videos about sleep hygiene, using white noise or a weighted blanket uh, to help improve quality of sleep. So you want to go ahead and watch those videos. The supplements you want to utilize after utilizing some of the sleep hygiene methods. Now, people can't sleep or fall asleep properly. Uh, it could be related to blood sugar. So you need to correct blood sugar problems. Or if you have anxiety, it could be a problem. So the top five supplements should be utilized after correcting other underlying mechanisms for sleep. So in terms of sleep quality, and the supplements are also great for chronic fatigue patients or ME patients uh, because their sleep uh, quality is, is disturbed. So, number one, I like to use magnesium L3 and 8. 300 to 500 milligrams, 45 minutes to an hour before bed. Now, magnesium has a lot of enzymatic processes and is quite beneficial uh, for a lot of different processes, but it has a calming effect. So, number one product I would use is magnesium. Okay, use this one first at the lowest dosage, maybe 300 milligrams, and see if it impacts your sleep quality. Do it for three, four, five days. After that, you can add in methylcobalamin, B12 or the active form of B12, one to two milligrams in the morning and one to two milligrams at noon. Again, using the lowest possible dosages on the scale. So you would start with one, right? One milligram. Methylcobalamin helps to reduce melatonin during the day and it keeps that reserve for at night so it could be released. So that's why we're using methylcobalamin more in the morning and around new time rather than at the evening time. Passionflower. You can use this as a tea. Passionflower has been known to decrease anxiety, increase GABA, which is an uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter, improve quality of sleep. Okay. CBD, <clears throat> 25 to 50 milligrams, 45 minutes before bed. Uh, there's a company called Charlotte Squibb, which has a pretty good product. Uh, it decreases nighttime cortisol and decreases anxiety, so you can get more of a restful sleep. You can also use valerian root after that, 300, uh, 100 to 300 milligrams, 45 minutes to an hour before bed you want to use 0.8% of the valeric acid form, okay? Increases quality of sleep and restfulness. So you don't have to take all five. You want to take the least amount of supplements to impact your sleep. So if you took magnesium and that improved or corrected your sleep issues, that's all you need to take. Then you can layer in methylcobalamin, passion flower, CBD and valerian root, okay? Always check with your doctors because, you know, it is a inhibitory neurotransmitter um, impact, and you always wanna make sure that it's not impacting your liver and, and other organs. So always check with your doctors before starting on any supplement regimen, okay? So those are my top five. I know there are others <clears throat> like 5-HTP which can also help improve sleep. 5-HTP will increase serotonin, which is kind of your happy neurotransmitter. You can take 50 milligrams of it, 45 minutes to an hour before bed. You can also use lithium orotate, five milligrams before bedtime, okay? Melatonin, Lo use the lowest possible dosage to make an impact. So whatever commercially available, you want to go to the lowest dosage possible to make an impact. Now, when you, again, when you use these supplements, you want to use it for about a week before you add on another supplement because one supplement uh, may do the trick uh, in terms of improving your quality of sleep and falling asleep. So you don't need to take you know, 10 supplements to sleep. <clears throat> kava Kava also has a profound effect on sleep, sleep quality, and so forth. There's a very small percentage they talk about uh, that it will increase liver uh, enzymes or liver damage. 
uh, but it's pretty rare, but you still want to check your blood work after taking kava kava to make sure your liver enzymes are not being elevated. All right, so those are my top five. Obviously, these are some of the other ones that you can utilize. The reason I put melatonin over here is because melatonin will suppress cortisol if you use it for long periods of time. So you want to use melatonin over a short period of time to improve sleep cycles or people who <clears throat> work the night shift and so forth. Um, so melatonin shouldn't be our first go-to. Like I said, I, I like magnesium L-theanate uh, first. Today we're going to talk about a hormone called melatonin. What is it? What does it do? How much should we take? And what are the benefits of taking it? So let's get right into what melatonin is. Melatonin, does it help with sleep? Question mark. Melatonin is a hormone produced by the pineal gland and the enterochromatophen of the GI tract or the gastrointestinal tract. So it's not just a hormone that's produced by the pineal gland in the brain, it's also produced in the GI tract. And therefore it has many wide, uh, broad benefits uh, in our system. So one, it helps the circadian rhythm regulation. And we know that because we talk about melatonin in sleep. However, it also helps the, the release and timing of hormones for reproduction. So it's very important for a pregnancy and so forth. It also helps with mood, your immune system, it's an antioxidant, it's an anti-inflammatory, and it helps with pain. It's also very important for anxiety and the regulation of your body temperature. So when you take melatonin at night, it helps you get into your sleep cycle. However, it also reduces your core body temperature when you go to bed. So it's very important that it has a systemic effect when you take melatonin. So what, what do we use it for? We use it for headaches, migraines, neurodegenerative changes, primary and secondary sleep disorders, sleep promotion, especially for people who work second shift and third shift. Their circadian rhythm is off, so they may work three or four nights in a row, and then they have the weekend off, and their sleep cycle is altered. For, th for some of those pa uh, patients, it's very important that their melatonin uh, is used appropriately for them. Also for people who travel a lot, go to California and back, right? Go to Europe and back. And they do frequent travel for work. And it can be helpful for people who have jet lag, okay? In terms of neurodegeneration, as our brain ages, uh, because the pineal gland is in the brain, you can have some calcification within the pineal gland uh, inhibiting the production of melatonin. So we have to kind of look at it uh, as a neurodegenerative process uh, for people who can't sleep at some times. It can also help with hypertension and insulin resistance or basically blood sugar regulation. So uh, blood sugar regulation can also affect sleep, but melatonin affects blood sugar. So it's kind of this cycle of different things that can affect our sleep pattern. So I wanna get into some of the physiology of this because this is an important hormone that affects um, a lot of different things and it can be beneficial for a lot of different patients. Okay, so when you look at it, if you get sunlight, right, this is my rudimentary drawing of the eye. So if you get sunlight and hits the retina, it has a transmission, a nerve transmission through the optic nerve and it goes to a nucleus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? The suprachiasmatic nucleus is the biological clock it sets our um, uh, wake cycle and sleep cycles. So light affects this as well as darkness. So for melatonin, when your eyes do not detect light, it will start to say, send a signal, right, to this nucleus. And that nucleus will send a signal to the PVN or paraventricular nucleus, all within the brain. And then that sends the signal to the superior cervical ganglion, which is in the upper cervical spine. And then that sends a signal to the pineal gland. So it's light affecting nerve, nerve transmission, 
through different uh, areas of the brain to the pineal gland. And the pineal gland, once the signal is sent, it triggers your body to produce uh, melatonin. And the way it tr produces it is it uses an essential amino acid called tryptophan. Tryptophan is converted to 5-HT and then to serotonin. And serotonin is actually a precursor to melatonin. So people who are on antidepressants, uh, people who have good serotonin levels, it can all impact how melatonin will work because serotonin is the precursor, right? So you need an essential amino acid and that needs to be converted. Another good supplement in here would be uh, B6 or P5P. Uh, it would be a good one. And melatonin, when it's produced from the pineal gland, will have a feedback mechanism back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is a feedback mechanism, right? It's the sleep cycle is a feedback mechanism. So melatonin goes up, you fall asleep, and then it goes down, and then you wake. So when you look at melatonin and its relationship to cortisol, cortisol is very high in the morning, which wakes you up, it makes you feel hungry, and melatonin is very low. As the day goes on, cortisol will start to drop, and by, let's say, 9 or 10, melatonin will start to come up, and cortisol goes down, and melatonin will peak around maybe 2 or 3 in the morning. So it goes up, and it starts to put you to sleep, and then it starts to wane down. So it has this inverse relationship between cortisol and melatonin. And that's why stress can impact sleep, because cortisol levels are high, and melatonin is suppressed at night, and you can't fall asleep. So stress is an imp important factor. So this loop is very important to understand how light, right, or darkness affects our sleep pattern. <clears throat> so what are some of the foods that we can use? Chocolate, milk, chickpeas, red meat, fish, poultry, cherries, walnuts, rice. So milk, we know, is one of those you know remedies like when you can't sleep they warm up milk for you and in maybe an hour or two you start to fall asleep and this is the reason why right in terms of dosaging when you have to dosage this you want to take it one to two hours before bedtime so you want the melatonin to work it's not a drug right it's not like where you take a drug and it has an immediate impact it's a natural sleep cycle um, hormone so you take it one to two hours before you actually want to go to bed and then it'll have a slow rise um, in how it's going to work so some of the studies have used 2.5 to 10 milligrams uh, in different types of studies for sleep and other physiological effects right however i recommend a dosage of like 0.1 to 3 milligrams right 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams i'm sorry right very very low dosage why because your body really doesn't need a lot of melatonin to make you fall asleep so rather than use higher doses you use lower doses to see what kind of physiological effect you can have and um, then you can ramp up the dosage over time right the bioavailability is about 15 percent so it's somewhat absorbable and it's also fat soluble and water soluble, so it will cross the blood brain barrier. With that being said, when you look at the dosages here, um, you want to use it before bedtime. Um, however, I don't recommend melatonin for everybody, right? It's actually a hormone, so I, it's one of the last things I actually recommend for sleep because you have to understand what the underlying mechanism for sleep issues are. So when we look at it, you have to think about sleep hygiene. Are we doing all the necessary things, right? Are we turning off the lights? Are we sleeping in a dark room? Are we looking at our phone? Uh, sleep hygiene is very important. Blood sugar. High blood sugar, low blood sugar, all affects sleep. So you have to make sure you're not hypoglycemic, insulin resistant, diabetic, right? These things will impact sleep overall. Sleep apnea, um, that's needs to be med medically tested, you need a sleep study. I like to use actually magnesium for sleep. I have a whole video on magnesium, so you can go ahead and watch that. But 
In terms of actually helping the sleep cycle, I like to use magnesium over melatonin in the beginning. So you can use magnesium uh, maybe one or two hours before bed. And the reason magnesium works so well is it helps to calm things down, right? It also helps to produce GABA or inhibitory neuro, uh, neurotransmitter. So it's very important nutrient for your sleep cycle. Now some of the adverse effects of taking melatonin could be dizziness, headache, nausea, hypothermia, meaning low body temperature, as we talked about uh, how it regulates body temperature, agitation, fatigue, fatigue in the sense that you take too much melatonin and you, don't, you feel groggy till like noon because the melatonin is not fully out of our system. So we have mood swings, we have heart palpitations and so forth. So there's a, a lot of different uh, side effects to this. However, in general, it's pretty safe. I would recommend not using high doses of melatonin and also taking it for a short period of time to regulate sleep cycles rather than use it as a crutch to sleep uh, for a long period of time. Why? Because it down regulates your receptor sites. What that means is that this loop right in here, right, how melatonin feeds back and forth, your receptors become resistant to it with any hormones, right? When you're, when you're provided exogenous or from the outside hormones to our body, your receptors will downregulate because there's a lot of it. And two, your body will stop producing that hormone or produce much less of that hormone. So you're interrupting this hormone pathway by taking exogenous hormones. So in my practice, we tend to use hormones last. Fix other underlying mechanisms first, right? And use things like magnesium and sleep hygiene and, and exercise uh, at proper levels to help patients fall asleep rather than use melatonin first. However, melatonin could be quite beneficial for those patients who have uh, tr troubles after doing everything they're supposed to be doing. So it's very important to do that. So I just wanna step away so you can take a look at this uh, little diagram. It's a great little diagram. I got this diagram from actually uh, the Ninja Nerds and uh, they have great explanation how, about how physiology works. And this little diagram comes from them. So I wanna give them uh, credit for that. In the past, I've made videos about sleep hygiene. One of the methods that we use in our office is recommending a weighted blanket. Now, can weighted blankets affect sleep? Yes. It's not meant for everybody but there are certain populations that can benefit from using a weighted blanket. So let's go into it. <clears throat> Will the weighted blanket affect sleep? Studies have shown that it manages patients who have anxiety and help them sleep a little bit better. It has positive impact on falling asleep and also staying asleep. It can be used for children and adults who have ADD or ADHD as well as autism spectrum disorders. There's definitely less tossing and turning when using a weighted blanket. And you want to give yourself at least seven to 10 days to get used to using the blanket. Now, how much should the blanket weigh? Now, that can vary, right? But the average would be 10 to 15% of your body weight. It can go up and down depending on what you like. Um, I would also recommend using a cotton uh, fabric rather than anything that's uh, synthetic, right? So you can use a weighted blanket, which is about 10 to 15 percent of your body weight, and it could impact your sleep. Now, how does it work, right? So the studies have shown that it improves uh, sleep for people who have anxiety, but how does it really work, right? So I used to be a artist when I was in school, so let's go right into this. A weighted blanket provides continual afferent stimulation. It stimulates our body and skin and weight receptors into the body and it goes up to the brain. Once it hits the brain, it starts to impact our neurotransmitters. So the continuous afferent stimulation or signaling through the body to the brain will increase serotonin, right? increase dopamine, which is your happy neurotransmitter, 
it will decrease cortisol. So that's important because cortisol should go down at night and melatonin should go up. So it decreases cortisol, increases GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and decreases seizures. So once that happens, from the brain, it sends a signal down to the heart, okay? Through the vagal nervous system, or the vagus. Once it hits the heart, it will decrease your heart rate. So this is the mechanism in terms of how it can help somebody who, have an, who has anxiety, or someone who's got uh, attention deficit disorder, or, or autism spectrum disorders. It can help by continual stimulation, affecting neurotransmitters and hormones, and then decreasing heart rate, all right? So if you've never tried a weighted blanket, it might be worth a try. So you might wanna go online and do your research. Um, again, use a, a cotton fabric rather than anything synthetic. Um, the drawbacks are that it can create some heat, right? So if you're someone who doesn't tolerate heat very well, this might not work. But with the upcoming winter months, it might work well for you. Um, also, if you like air conditioning and use a weighted blanket, that should be fine. Today we're gonna to talk about white noise for the betterment of sleep. So let's get right into it. Using white noise for better sleep. White noise significantly improves sleep based on subjective and objective measurements. In subjects complaining of difficulty sleeping in high levels of environmental noise. The World Health Organization estimates that there are approximately 25% of the population that live in urban areas that has a lot of extraneous noise, car honking or bars with people screaming or music or whatever it is during the sleep hours. So the use of white noise can be utilized to help improve uh, overall sleep. Now, this was a very small study. They took 10 subjects from a sleep clinic uh, from the city and they used a subjective questionnaire or a sleep diary and a motion logger actigraph to look at uh, the patient's movement during sleep. And they also used a white noise machine called a Dom Classic by Mark Pack. It's about $50 on Amazon, right, for that machine. And what they found in the 10 subjects is that they did a baseline um, subjective and the, and the motion studies, and then they did a week of uh, using the white noise uh, and then a washout period of another week without the white noise. And they found that uh, the 10 subjects actually had better sleep quality uh, over that um, one week period when they were using white noise. So the questionnaire was used and the motion uh, detection um, portion was used. These days, you can get white noise from apps, uh, very cheap uh, or even free. And then you can do motion logger uh, just by using maybe like an Apple phone that detects movement and so forth. And you can check to see if it improves your quality of sleep um, on your own. They've also done studies uh, on 60 subjects at the critical care unit uh, and looking at uh, sleep quality for these patients that are at the hospital and critical, critical care. You have to remember that when you're in these types of environments, there are people, nurses walking in and out of the rooms, uh, there's machines, they're beeping, they're waking up the patients to do blood draw. So they're doing a lot of different things. So when they split the 60, and I believe actually the, uh, the study actually says 31 and 31, so it was 62. But <clears throat> they looked at the patient population that got the white noise versus the patient population that didn't get the white noise, and they did see a significant improvement in sleep quality in the critical care unit. So if you are in, in an urban area and you have extraneous noise that come into your bedroom, you might want to consider using white noise uh, to help improve quality of sleep. The inability to sleep is an epidemic here in the United States, and sleep is necessary for proper healing and recovery. So let's get into the three common reasons why you cannot stay asleep once you fall asleep. So let's get into the facts. Three common reasons. Number one is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a drop in blood sugar. So this can often happen with people who have anxiety, who have maybe low blood pressure, who had concussions, where they 
basically burn up their fuel. Hypoglycemic symptoms are when you eat and maybe one or two hours later you have a drop in blood sugar and you can have irritability, you feel shaky, you can feel angry or hangry. So you have these signs and symptoms. People don't realize though when you have blood sugar drops in the middle of the night, it can wake you up from a deep sleep. So let's say you have dinner around six or seven, okay? And you don't want to eat anything else because you don't want to gain weight, etc. So in around one, two, or three in the morning, what happens is your blood sugar will start to drop and cortisol will start to go up in order to signal the liver to produce more sugar. When cortisol goes up, it wakes you out of a deep sleep. And then you'll wake up two in the morning and cannot fall back asleep, maybe an hour or two before you can go back to sleep. So hypoglycemia is one of those reasons that people don't think about when it relates to sleep disturbance. Number two, silent reflux. People who have reflux disease or GERD or gastroesophageal refluxive disease, you can have a little bit of stomach acid that regurgitates slightly up and it causes a cough. So when you lie down in the middle of the night, you can start to cough in the middle of the night, waking you up out of a deep sleep. So if you have a, a cough that gets worse in the middle of the night or when you first lie down, then you want to look at reflux disease. When you're looking at reflux disease, you're looking at either low stomach acid issues, high stomach acid issues, H. pylori infections, or food sensitivities. So you have to look at many multiple factors when we look at silent reflux. Number three is diabetes and prediabetes. So diabetes will create things like restless leg syndrome. It can also create things like peripheral neuropathy where you have burning, numbness, or tingling in the feet. And diabetics also tend to get up frequently in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. So they get up, go to the bathroom, maybe not fall back asleep again. So these are very um, common symptoms related to sleep disturbance in the middle of the night. Obviously there are others. Pain is one. So if you have uh, lower back pain, you have sciatica. Pain can be one of those contributing factors where it wakes you up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep because pain also stimulates cortisol. Perimenopause and menopause. Obviously there are things like night sweats and um, uh, hot flashes that will wake you up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep. Sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea. People who do not sleep through the night because of breathing issues, snoring. So this is one where your a partner or spouse can listen to you in the middle of the night and they see that you stop breathing for 10 seconds or you snore very heavily. Those people with sleep apnea will have significant fatigue in the afternoons, in the mornings, just they just can't get enough oxygen throughout the night and not uh, the proper deep REM sleep. So sleep apnea is a big one. Post-concussion. Most people think about you have a concussion and they might sleep a lot. Okay, But there is a flip side to this where people have concussions and they cannot sleep or they wake up and they can't go back to sleep. And the, the reason this happens is because it's neuroinflammatory. There's some activation of immune cells called microglia in the brain and it creates this vicious cycle where you just can't regulate cortisol and melatonin. Okay? The other one is um, benign prostatic hypertrophy. If your prostate's enlarged, um, you will get up and go to the bathroom uh, multiple times throughout the night. So urinary frequency is another factor. So when we look at these facts, these three are very, very common. So is pain, menopause, perimenopause, sleep apnea, post-concussion, and benign prosthetic hypertrophy. In terms of hypoglycemia, the way to correct this is eating uh, good quality protein and fats into your diet and reducing 
uh, complex uh, simple carbs or sugar. Also, eating uh, maybe like a sliver of turkey with avocado will stabilize your blood sugar. Turkey is high in tryptophan, so you will also get into a deeper sleep. You want to eat the turkey and avocado maybe one hour, maybe even half hour before you actually go to bed. That way your blood sugar will not drop and you have excess levels of tryptophan so you can sleep deeper. Silent reflux is more complicated because you have to look at food sensitivities, make, uh, maybe take digestive enzymes, uh, maybe gallbladder issues. So there's multiple factors with silent reflux and you need to get to the root cause of it. Diabetes, prediabetes, you need to get your blood sugar checked. You want to do a fasting glucose. You want to do a hemoglobin A1C uh, on blood work. You could even do something called fasting uh, insulin or C-peptide to look at if you have diabetes. So it's very important to get to the underlying mechanisms to correct the sleep. Sleep is crucial for you to recover and heal from chronic disease. If you have autoimmune disease, you really need to sleep in order to recover. So sleep is crucial to your health and recovery, as well as food, lifestyle, reducing stress, etc. Today we're going to talk about people who experience anxiety when they first wake up in the morning. And this is due to a dysfunctional cortisol awakening response. So let's get right into it. Morning cortisol awakening response, or what we call CAR, okay? CAR, increase of cortisol by up to 50% first thing in the morning when you get up. Approximately 20 to 30 minutes upon awakening, you're gonna have what we call peak cortisol. CAR is a brain-based mechanism. The hypothalamus speaks to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and speaks to the hippocampus, which is all part of the brain. The suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hippocampus are basically the pacemaker of cortisol rhythm, your circadian rhythm. So the brain is responsible for waking you up and putting you back to sleep, okay? So there's multiple factors that will impact this. Okay? You cannot reestablish the cortisol awakening response by taking adrenal glands, okay, or adrenal supplements. You have to be able to do uh, a few different things in order to re-establish the cortisol awakening response. <clears throat> so, what are some of the signs and symptoms of a dysfunctional cortisol response? No appetite in the morning, or they will often crave sugar first thing in the morning, or coffee. Okay? They need a big cup of coffee to get started. Some people will feel anxiety and feel irritable first thing in the morning. And they must move to feel normal, meaning they feel so lethargic, right? And they can't move and they just can't get out of bed. They need to start moving around for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, gets the blood flow going, and then they start to feel what we call normal, okay? So these are some of the signs and symptoms of a dysfunctional cortisol rhythm. How do we establish the cortisol awakening response? Okay. Number one, you want to use sunrise stimulation from red to bright yellow. You can get an alarm clock or you can get these lighting um, mechanism with timers where the light will come on at a certain time and it will, get, it will go from red to bright yellow very slowly over maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes and it brightens up the room. And that is what wakes you up out of a deep sleep rather than a loud alarm, okay? So you wanna be able to stimulate or simulate a sunrise. The other two thing is high intensity exercise within 10 minutes of awakening, right? So you wanna get up, you wanna do calisthenics, squats, push-ups, sit-ups, and you want to do it very aggressively for two to five minutes, depending on your capacity. So you might start at 30 seconds per day in the beginning, and then work your way up to a minute, two minute, three minute, up to five minute maximum. So you want to get your blood flow going, 
You want your cortisol response to, uh, to start to reestablish within that 10 minutes of awakening. You can also use glyceriza or basically licorice root within 10 minutes of awakening. Now, glyceriza has been shown to improve the half-life of cortisol. So rather than your adrenal glands trying to produce more cortisol, glyceriza will help um, improve the half-life of cortisol in our system. It also improves aldosterone, okay? The caution is, if you have hypertension, you have to be cautious about using licorice root because it increases blood pressure in some people. Number four, no sugar or caffeine. Sometimes it's very tough to uh, get through that first week or two of no caffeine, but you need to reestablish this, so no caffeine or sugar in the morning. And what you want to do is increase fats and proteins. So if you're not allergic to eggs, Greg, uh, eggs are a great source of protein. You can fats, you can use avocado, um, or you can use turkey bacon. So you can use a, a few different things in the morning to get your uh, first nutritious meal. No sugar in the morning, okay? Also, you wanna plan before, um, the night before. What that means is you wanna write down the things that you have to do for the next day. So it's not on your mind. So you don't wanna think about it overnight, like I have to do this, I have to do that. You wanna kinda of clear your mind. So a little bit of journaling first thing uh, before bed, and then maybe first thing getting up in the morning just to jot things down. That'll clear your mind as to all the different little stressors that'll be uh, impacting your day, all right? Another one is proper amount of quality sleep. You have to be able to sleep deeply in a good setting where you're not waking up frequently. Oftentimes, blood sugar is a part of this, so you wanna manage your blood sugar. Also, if you look at your sleep cycle, it's about 90 minutes to 110 minutes. So you wanna be able to sleep maybe four to six sleep cycles through the night. And ideally, you wanna wake up at the end of your sleep cycle rather than right in the middle, okay? So you, you wanna be able to plan for at least six to eight or nine hours of sleep if you're looking at the different sleep cycles. But you can use these steps to reestablish what we call the cortisol awakening response. So if you feel anxious, you want to try these methods and see if that will help you, okay? Today we're going to talk about sleep and neuroinflammation or inflammation of the brain, right? So when we look at patients who do not have proper sleep and do not function very well during the day and their cognitive decline will continue because of lack of sleep, we have to say, what is the mechanism, right? But before we go into the mechanism, let's look at how does neuroinflammation affect the brain, right? There are a few studies out there. So sleep disturbance induces inflammation and impairment of learning and memory, right? There are studies done on this to see how sleep deprivation can affect memory and learning, right? If you think about how uh, large the population is in terms of dementia, Alzheimer's, if you do not get proper sleep, it's going to affect those patients even further down the line. The next study here is sleep disturbance promotes microglia. Microglia is the immune cells of the brain. Microglial activation and results in anxiety and learning impairment. Patients don't realize that anxiety can, can come from a lack of sleep, or sometimes vice versa, anxiety can create lack of sleep. So you can have this interplay between anxiety and sleep creating activation of the immune cells of the brain that creates low-grade, low, grade, low uh, neuroinflammation, right? So patients don't realize that sleep deprivation or sleep quality will significantly impact brain function throughout the day. So what are the common causes? One of the biggest causes of insomnia is dysglycemia, meaning hypoglycemia and insulin resistance or diabetes. People don't realize or they don't, they don't make the connection between how sugar can create insomnia. It's one of the biggest causes, so it has to be addressed. 
So when you have hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, you're going to have symptoms where if you skip a meal, you feel angry, tired, agitated, anxious, right? And as soon as you have a meal, you go, oh, I feel so much better, right? Those are the patients who have low blood sugar. The people who have insulin resistance or diabetes are the patients who crave sugar all the time. They eat a meal and they fall asleep or they eat a meal and they feel like they want to have a snack or a dessert. Those are the patients who have insulin resistance or diabetes. The insulin resistance people, you're going to see that they start to lose some hair, right? Uh, they can lose like hair on the legs in the lower section because of poor circulation. So when we look at it, hypoglycemia and diabetes or insulin resistance is probably the biggest cause of insomnia. Now, how do we check for that? We check fasting morning glucose. We also check for something called hemoglobin A1C, which is your two to three month average of blood sugar. You can check something called C-peptide, which looks at insulin levels in the morning uh, fasting. You can also check two hour postperennial uh, glucose. A lot of women who get uh, diabetes or pre-diabetes or pregnancy will do this test. Uh, you can also look for antibodies, right? Do we have uh, isolate cell antibodies, right? Do we have uh, uh, GAD65 antibodies? So you can look at different antibodies to see if we have autoimmune versions of the uh, diabetes. But in, in essence, low blood sugar, high blood sugar will disrupt sleep. When you get low blood sugar, what happens is let's say you eat at six, and because you want to lose weight and you don't want to you know, eat too much, you don't eat anything until you go to bed and then you'll wake up one or two in the morning wide awake, right? Why does that happen? Because when you have low blood sugar states, your body will kick off cortisol and it'll tell the liver, hey, my sugar is too low. You need to wake up and eat or produce sugar. So the liver will start to start the process of gluconeogenesis where it starts to produce sugar but it's highly active. So the body actually wakes up and you can't go back to sleep one or two in the morning. You might be up for half an hour or an hour, right? So low blood sugar will actually disrupt sleep in the middle of the night. When you have diabetes or insulin resistance, when you sleep, you might be able to kind of nod off right after a big heavy meal, but then you have a hard time falling asleep, right? And then when you do fall asleep, you have to go up, get up and go to the bathroom because your urinary function is not as good. You have to keep running to the bathroom. So your sleep gets disrupted throughout the night. So it's very important to look at blood sugar and the management of insomnia. And insomnia relates to neuroinflammation.